This is Corey Willis with PVI, and you're listening to the Diesel Podcast. I'm Adam Blattenberg from Diesel World. This is Dan, owner of Dan's Diesel Performance. I'm Cass from Diesel Doctor of Tennessee, and you're listening to the Diesel Podcast. What is going on, Diesel Nation? We're excited to have you guys with us today on the number one diesel truck podcast on iTunes. We have a very special guest today. Guy from SoCal Diesel is going to be on the podcast, and he's been in diesel performance since the very beginning. He started 2003, 2004 with the LB7, and has pioneered so many upgrades for the engines from then till now. And we're going to ask him some questions that you guys gave us from Instagram about pistons, crank, heads, and tons of other things. And he's also going to give us an inside look at the L5P engine and some things that they found that are going to be weak points and solutions they're already working on for the truck. Before we get to the episode, we want to thank a couple of our partners that helped make these episodes possible. The first is Diesel World Magazine. We're huge fans of Diesel World and the content and the information that they're able to bring all of us enthusiasts. Make sure you head on over to dieselworldmag.com, bookmark the page, or pick up an issue when you see it in a store. There's tons of insights you're not going to get anywhere else, and those guys do a fantastic job of covering the diesel community, motorsports, and products, and everything that we want to know more about. Also, Jeremy from Nitro Gear is going to be on an episode here shortly, and we're going to be talking to him about lockers and what benefits you get changing gears on a truck with stock or close to stock tires. It's a very interesting topic and a huge amount of upside that you're able to see with that. So stay tuned for it. If you're looking for gears now, locker, other upgrades, just head on over to nitro-gear.com. Check out what they have. If you have any questions, just give them a call. They've got a very knowledgeable staff there that is familiar with what we're doing with diesel trucks, whether we're towing, daily driving, or it's a race application. All right, let's get to the podcast with Guy and learn more about Duramax diesel engines. Guy, welcome to the Diesel Podcast. I'm excited to to chat with you, and I know a lot of our listeners are excited to hear from you and learn about SoCal Diesel. You guys are synonymous with Duramax performance and tons of things over the years you guys have been doing and it's it's going to be a, a duramax centered podcast we're excited to chat with you thanks for having me we uh on instagram had posted up uh a story and said hey we're gonna have socal diesel on the podcast what do you guys want to know and there's so many new listeners and people who are new to diesel that are finding out about the podcast or wanting to know what to do with their truck and i wanted to have you introduce yourself to our listeners with a little bit of background on how you got started in engines and how you started SoCal Diesel and, and what the story was to you know be able to you know, make your company one of the, the leading companies in aftermarket performance in diesel. My background really is as a uh, cylinder head engineer. Um, so I owned part of a company previously where I designed aluminum cylinder heads for NASCAR racing. And, uh, you know, I bought a Duramax diesel to tow my NASCAR late model, something that I drove and raced competitively on the West Coast, uh, back and forth to the racetrack. And uh, like anything I own, I had to make it my own. <laughs> and so uh, one thing led to another, and uh, I kind of pushed the limit on it. And uh, next thing you know, I was designing cylinder heads and parts and miscellaneous things to improve the Duramax for not only myself, but the rest of the diesel community. Was it a LB7 that you started with? It was, in fact, yeah, it was an LB7. Um, uh, 2003 crew cab long bed, and it kind of turned the world on its edge back in uh, 2003, 2004, when we had that 8,000-pound pig doing 1290s in the quarter. It was really exciting to, you know, you, like we think back to that time, there wasn't, is it a newer platform, and just kind of being there at the at the start, and you probably found weak points throughout the whole process of, you know, with the heads or you know just fueling and the rotating assembly and all those different things so you were able to pioneer you know getting or offering a higher kind of like a higher end build or a performance build for that engine at the start yeah absolutely i mean what it was is uh much like some of my other projects you know i had just identified the weak points and just applied my, my background and my engineering skills to solving those problems. And, and the really funny thing is, is when you would approach some of the vendors um, in the industry, and I would say, hey, uh, like my friends at AR, ARP, uh, I'd had a relationship with them since, oh boy, 1978 or 79. And when I approached them about building head studs for the Duramax engine, the first thing they said was, why would anybody want to race a diesel? <laughs> and, uh, you know, I showed them a video of my <clears throat> 
big heavy truck taking down a stock Camaro, stock Corvette, and they said, hmm, now we understand. Okay, what do you need, guy? <laughs> it's changed a lot. You know, we look at where racing is at now and and the times and everything. It's, you know, 15 years, it's it's progressed really quick. Yeah, eventually, I mean, for, for me, SoCal Diesel, I was a partner in that other company, and it got to the point where um, after a long time, um, the partners and I weren't really – getting along as, uh, as well as we should. And I actually tried to start a diesel performance section in that company, and they weren't really interested in it. So I thought, well, you know what, 2005, it's uh, 2006, it's time for me to uh, go on and uh, do something else. And so that's how SoCal Diesel was born. And as far as SoCal Diesel, if people go to SoCalDiesel.com, what, what kind of products or, or what, what, what's the, the main focus of, of what you guys offer in the aftermarket? Uh, we're we're kind of the freaks of the diesel industry in that we we focus on the hard parts. Um, you know, we don't do a lot of air cleaners and exhaust systems and you know wheels, tires, that kind of stuff. We're more the hardcore engine parts guy. Um, we're looking for solutions to problems. So if there's something that's preventing the the Duramax industry from achieving the next power level or the next you know desired uh, sled pull achievement or um, you know, race, at the racetrack, something at the racetrack, we're looking to solve those problems. And, and so that kind of started off with just, you know, head studs and, you know, morphed into ported heads and, you know, aftermarket rods and cranks and pistons. And so uh, we've been creating those solutions and solving problems since uh, for about 13 years now. I've got a bunch of questions from our listeners, and I know that each of these questions could be an entire podcast by themselves <laughs> but we've seen them come up before and, and you're a pioneer and an expert with that platform and i'm just going to rattle off a handful of them and and we'll, you know we'll chat about you know it could be an lb7 it could be an lbz but i think as far as helping educate a, a, you know a, a, tr- a diesel truck owner a, a duramax owner out there i think it'll really help guide them with with their build and, and answer their questions you know, before they get into it, so they have a solid plan. And one of the first ones, and I know this has been really popular with UCC and the performance side, is what what inspired you to do the 7.1 liter stroker kit, and what what does that offer the the owner of that truck in a performance application? That's a really good question. Um, you know, we were involved. Uh, I want to say 2007, six or seven. Uh, we were fortunate enough to be involved in the first. 1,000 horsepower rear wheel uh, Duramax. So the first Duramax that put down 1,000 rear wheel horsepower was it was quite the thing back then. You know, now it's just a daily driver. I mean, that's something yeah. you drive back and forth to the supermarket. But um, as as we pushed the level on these Duramax engines, we realized that you know the crank was a weak point and, and it was certainly a problem. And so I set out to build um, an indestructible crankshaft. You know, what what's the best possible crankshaft I can I can build? And so when I had that done. Uh, on the design table and was ready to go into manufacturing, I kind of sat back and I asked myself, this is going to be a very expensive crankshaft. I mean, we can build it really cheap, but let's not, let's not cut any corners on this because if we do and we cut a corner where the, where the crank fails, then it's just going to you know, kind of cast a shadow on the whole project. So let's make sure we do it with the best materials, the best machining, you know, everything that we can do to make it the best possible crankshaft ever. Um, and we've certainly achieved that. But getting back to that question, what kind of value-added design can we put into this? And one of the thoughts was, well, how much stroke will the stock block take before we have to do any kind of surgery? Because obviously, you know, surgery isn't something that you know, John Q. Public really wants to do in his garage when he's putting one of these things together. Right. And I try to keep the guy, the do-it-yourselfer, in all the products that we design, I try to keep the do-it-yourselfer in mind because there are a lot of guys that are very mechanically inclined and are certainly able to do this, but maybe don't have you know huge machining centers where they can do you know elaborate machining process. Uh, so the answer on the stroke was we could put a quarter inch of stroke and we wouldn't have to do any surgery on the block. And so that's that's how the stroker crank came about. We built uh, we built about ten stroker cranks and ten stock stroke cranks. And for the same amount of money, the crank cost the exact same amount of money. And most guys were buying pistons and rods anyway. So in a stroker application, the only thing that changes is the crank and the piston. The rods remain the same. 
So if a guy had a set of rods left over, maybe a set of nice gorilla rods left over from a stock crank build that he had broke, he could use those rods in a stroker build. And so we ended up selling out on the stroker cranks, and I think we had about five of the stock strokes left. So we built 10 more strokers, and we had, by the time we sold those 10, I think we were down to maybe one or two of the stock strokes. And so it's it's basically been about a two-to-one uh, sales ratio ever since. So. <laughs> We had a question a long time ago, and it's it's perfect. We're chatting today. Is and I don't remember if it was an LBZ or LLY that that the listener had, but they said, at what point do I need, or what power level do I need to worry about my stock crank? Where would you say is the breaking point between, hey, that we're getting into a danger zone here, and we need to start thinking about preventing you know the crank from from having an issue, and then say going with the the seven point one liter stroker kit. Um, you know, that's a really, another really good question, um, which is kind of hard to, to quantify into an exact power level because if we get, you know, too aggressive on the tuning, um, too aggressive on the converter lockup points, transmission, there's a lot of things that can cause a crankshaft to break. There's, there's just a lot of things going on. And, and as GM found out, I mean, when they switched over to the LBZ LMM platform, um, they went to a heavier bob weight and more external weight outside the motor. That is to say, to make up for the heavier internal components, they put more weight on the damper and more weight on the flywheel, and their crankshaft failures went through the roof after that. Interestingly note, they went back the other way on the LML engines. But to kind of bring it full circle back into the initial question on what kind of power level, I mean, I think, honestly, on the LB7, LLY cranks, once we crossed over about Seven eight hundred horsepower. It wasn't a question on if the crank was going to break. It was just when. Gotcha. And then on the on the later on the later models, does it still kind of fall into that roughly eight nine hundred horsepower? Or could they go a little farther, or is it just? You know, the problem with the it all comes down to internal weight of the components. So um, the LBZ LMM. You know, if you're talking about all stock components. Um, they were a problem just because of the additional weight. So the crankshaft is constantly in a, in a torsional twist. It's always flexing. Every time there's a, uh, a power cycle, it twists the crankshaft, and then there's a response where the crankshaft comes back off that twist and goes the other way. And then you can kind of see these frequencies kind of calm down until the next power cycle on that particular cylinder. So um, like any piece of metal, if you bend it enough back and forth, uh, it's or too short. far, it, it's mm-hmm. eventually going to break. You had mentioned uh, your pistons before, and this was another question that, that we got was, cast versus forged, and what are the benefits of one versus the other? And I know it's a huge topic, but, you know, us diesel guys, we, we like to get, <laughs> we just want like a, you know, a catch-all answer. This is what you need to go with, and it, it's so hard to do that. But I know cast versus forge is a really big topic when someone's looking at a, an engine build and trying to decide what piston to go with. Sure. Um, cast pistons, again, for, from a horsepower level, we kind of draw the line at about 800 rear wheel horsepower. Um, some guys might be able to push them a little bit farther, but again, when we're dealing with a customer on the phone, we want to make sure that we're, we're not building them a one-hit wonder um, or supplying parts for a one-hit wonder. When we supply them a, a rotating assembly or a complete engine, we want to make sure it fits his needs, and it's going to fit his needs for a long time, as long as he remains at the power level we discussed. So once we get above 800 horsepower, um, the cast pistons are really uh, not going to hold up too well to that kind of cylinder pressure and heat. You know, the, the cylinder pressure is, is what we need to push the piston down, so as the horsepower goes up or torque goes up, we've got to create more cylinder pressure. Heat is a byproduct of that. Um, so the cast piston really starts to get into a failure mode above that power level, at least in the Duramax engine. Um, and one thing to remember on a cast versus forged debate is that you know, cast, we pour molten aluminum into a mold, and it solidifies. We take it out of the mold, and we begin machining it. A forged piston, we pour the molten aluminum into a die mold, and that die mold then compresses that molten aluminum. So that's the forging process. It's being compressed, so all the molecules are being compressed to a much tighter grain structure, which makes a, a much stronger piston. You know, as far as driving these trucks, and it's it's something 
that we know a, a lot of truck owners that are that are calling you guys and saying, "Hey, I need these parts," or uh, you know, "I want to do this with my my Duramax," is they might be driving it on the street. It, it might be something that's not just a track only vehicle. Is is a forged piston reliable in a? I wouldn't say like a tow truck, but like something you might drive around town, take to test and tunes, hit some events during the year, but you're putting miles on it. Do they hold up well to the heat cycles and, and, and those sorts of things? It really comes down to metallurgy. So um, a lot of the misconceptions about forged piston is that, you know, all forged pistons are alike. And what you really need to be asking about with regard to a forged piston is what alloy is that forging made out of? So in the case of uh, the mall forged pistons, they're made from a 4032 alloy, 4032. And that's a, a high silicon alloy, which means it's very thermally stable. Um, so you're going to have about five, 6,000 piston to cylinder wall clearance. On uh, some of the other com uh, competitors' pistons, um, they use a 2618 alloy, which is a great piston alloy. It's been around for a long time. It's just not as thermally stable. So. Um, at static, you're going to have a piston to cylinder wall clearance of, say, 13 thousandths. So the problem becomes on a cold start. So for a guy that's driving the thing on the street, let's say he has three cold starts a day. He has a cold start in the morning, and the piston's rattling around until it comes up to temperature. That's really hard on the skirts and really hard on the ring pack. Um, lunchtime, maybe he goes out to get a burger. It's another cold start, and then at the end of the day, he's got you know, a, an additional third cold start. So as you can see, a piston that's got five or six thousandths clearance is not going to rattle around, be as hard on the piston and the cylinder walls as one that's got 13. Once the piston comes up to temperature, it's not an issue. So if the guy's driving cross-country and never shuts the motor off, he can do 100,000 miles, 200,000 miles with a forged piston and not have an issue. But it really comes down to those cold starts. So to further expand on that, before we started introducing the forged piston to our customers, we went through uh, a testing process where we put forged pistons in one of our daily drivers, and we put about 40,000, 50,000 miles on it with three to four cold starts every day. And disassembled it, took a look at it, everything looked great. Yeah, there was some wear, but nothing that was abnormal. And so we went ahead and pushed the thing over the 80,000, 90,000 mile mark. And so my recommendation to most people when they're trying to make this decision is if you're on the cusp of that, say, 800 uh, horsepower level and you're trying to decide between cast and forged, putting a cast in and having the piston crack and break and destroy the engine in a short amount of time versus putting a forged in and driving it every day and enjoying the thing for, let's say, 80 to 100,000 miles, I don't think that's really a choice. Yeah, you're going to have to replace rings or maybe even a set of pistons in 100,000 miles, but at least you know the piston's going to get there. Right. Cast piston and saying, hey, I'm going to put this together because I don't have to worry about ring groove wear or ring wear. Well, yeah, but you've got to worry about the piston cracking and destroying the whole motor. So uh, that's really the decision it comes down to. This is sort of in line, I think, when somebody calls you, whether it's a shop or a truck owner and they're they're wanting to build an engine all these things kind of feed together and this next question was when do i need billet main caps a girdle or both and i wanted to to ask you you know if say i had a duramax and i want to build it and i call in and you know we're talking about forged pistons and maybe the 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 stroker kit i'm probably going to do billet main caps i mean the, the motor's going to be a part i'm going to add those on but as far as advising a customer, you know, to do a girdle or, or both, what, what sort of direction or guidelines do you guys use when suggesting that? It's really interesting. You know, the Duramax engine was designed around a certain power level. You know, the engineers at GM are pretty sharp cookies. And they decided there's going to be a certain amount of torque this engine's going to make, and then we're going to design in a certain uh, amount of fail-safe into that. And so what we found is, over the years with regard to things like the fuel system. You know, when you were trying to make on an LB7, you know, 500 plus at the rear tire, the injectors, CP3 pump, everything kind of ran out right about the same power level. And what we've seen on the internal engine components is kind of a similar thing. So at the risk of repeating myself, once we cross over that 800 horsepower level, that, that rear wheel horsepower level, we start to see a lot of things fail. And I think that just means that 
we're starting to cross over the point that all the original product was designed or we're crossing over that fail-safe mode. So what happens with regard to the main caps is with that cylinder pressure, that power level, all that force is being transmitted to the crank and then into the bearing and the main cap. And the main cap material is only, the stock main cap material is only going to be able to hold back so much pressure before it starts to fail. And what happens is the cap, the U of the cap, if you will, starts to close up on itself. And when it closes up on itself, now the parting line of the bearing comes in and it starts to scrape oil off the crankshaft. And then obviously at that point we have bearing and crankshaft failure. So what we find a lot is when the motor comes in or the block comes in and they've exceeded that power level is now the main cap doesn't even fit the block tight anymore. It's been stressed to the point that it's permanently deformed and it may only be a couple of thou, but a couple of thou in a racing engine is enough to determine whether it fails or succeeds. And so with regard to that main cap material, um, we go to a billet, a billet cap so that we can prevent that cap from collapsing on itself under extreme pressure. Now the girdle is kind of serves a different function. Um, the girdle adds structure to the back of the block or the bottom of the block, and what it does, one of the main things it does, is it will prevent the main caps from flexing, say, forward and backward in the block. So um, what we've seen is, obviously, we're going to apply pressure to an engine component, and it's going to take the path of least resistance. In the, in the situation with the main cap, we've got two bolts vertically. We've got a cross-bolt situation. And without the girdle, we've seen evidence on the bearing where the cap is actually kind of flexed forward, or the fasteners, everything is just kind of flexed forward, and we start to see that kind of side wear on the bearing. And so the, the, the cap and the girdle kind of go hand in hand uh, when we get into these extreme power levels because they're both solving two different problems. Gotcha. Okay. So it, it would definitely be something at the point of an engine build is going to do both, you know, and, and uh, be able to address both issues versus, you know, them, they're not addressing the same issue. So it's, it's, it seems like, you know, like at the point of an engine build, probably most customers are or ordering both from you guys as part of a complete engine build? Everybody has a budget, and, and if, a, if a customer actually is kind of right on the ragged edge, like, you know, okay, uh, I can't really afford both, or, or whatever reason, you know, what do you recommend, either or? Our recommendation is going to be the cap first, um, because even if we put a girdle on, um, that doesn't solve the issue of the cap, the stock cap closing in on itself. So if I had to make a decision between one or the other, it would be caps first, and then if the budget allowed, girdle after, or girdle as well. One of the most popular topics we're seeing, and we, we get tons of questions from listeners, and they're, just, they're eating up the information, is the L5P. And as far as the engines, what, what have you guys been seeing with them? What sort of weak points are, are coming about and solutions that you guys are finding for this latest motor? Well, it's... Uh... It's in its infancy right now, so we've just recently, uh, the industry just recently has uh, achieved the ability to tune those ECMs, and so now what I think we're going to see is uh, more and more people are going to push the limits on that, and we're going to begin to see more and more failures. Um, to this point, um, I personally haven't seen any failures. I mean, the guys are in the 650 to 750 rear wheel horsepower. Um, I'm kind of waiting to see, but I think we're just now, you know, as we kind of talk about that 800 rear wheel horsepower level, we're just now starting to achieve the power levels where we're going to see um, these failures start to come into play in the future. Um, nevertheless, SoCal Diesel isn't sitting on their hands waiting to see what's going to fail, looking at the internal components. So we've got a couple of motors here that we've already uh, taken apart, you know, nothing blown up yet, but things that were run, and we've taken them apart and kind of assessed where the weak points are going to be, and certainly uh, a lot of the similar weak points are going to uh, reveal themselves, I think, pretty shortly, you know, with regard to the piston and the rods. Um, we've already developed a, a billet crank for them. Um, head studs, we've worked hand-in-hand -hand with ARP, again, one of our trusted vendors that we have a great relationship with. So head studs, main studs um, have already been... Uh, designed and are in production now. I'm not sure when the release date is on that, but it's going to be pretty soon. Um, and again, inject injector clamps, ported, uh, billet injector clamps, um, 
as we build more and more cylinder pressure, that cylinder pressure is not only pushing the piston down, but it's trying to push the injector right out of the hole. So having a good quality can clamp and a good fastener uh, is paramount. And then, of course, getting back to my roots. I mean, the very first product I developed for the Duramax was a ported cylinder head. And so uh, we already have our Stage 1 ported heads ready to go on the L5P, and we're, we're working on the Stage 2s as we speak. How would you compare the cylinder head performance in, as far as the stock heads on an L5P to some of the previous Duramax engines? Uh, that's a great question. Uh, what I've seen is, unfortunately, the GM engineers haven't really put a lot of thought into cylinder head design, unfortunately. Um, since even the LB7 days, it just seems like they use the cylinder head as a way to connect the turbocharger to the <laughs> exhaust manifold. So, uh, again, with my background in cylinder head design, uh, you know, the Duramax stock cylinder heads have probably been some of the more disgusting cylinder heads I've seen. But, hey, that makes it easy for me. You know, I can come in and, and make some pretty good improvements on them. Um, so with regard to the L5P, um, not seeing a tremendous difference in performance uh, as far as overall port flow goes. Um, they did make an interesting change into the intake side where they, uh, they've kind of recessed uh, the intake side, in a sense, they've shortened up the intake runners and given the intake system more plenum volume. Uh, now we're starting to get into, you know, cylinder head design technical terms. But essentially what they did is, is they made a good change there. Um, what I'm kind of disappointed to find on, on the head is that it, it doesn't have the ability to be modified as far as we could the previous platform. So 7 through L's we could get a certain amount of airflow through them. And, and we're working in the envelope. So we have a casting, a stock casting, and you can only port it so far before it becomes unreliable. And the best flowing cylinder head in the world doesn't do any good if it's not reliable, if it doesn't hold water, if it doesn't, you know, seats and guides don't stay in place, that kind of deal. So with regard to that, I think the L5P has more water jacketing in it, which means there's less material for us to modify and, and enlarge and, and get better flow out of the ports. It, I was just thinking as well, you know, as far as like with the L5P coming out, is there so much passion and excitement and brand loyalty? If you're a Duramax guy, you're a Duramax guy. And, the you know, the, the trucks have so much potential to be, you know, tuned and make good power, even above and beyond what previous models could. But there's always that kind of waiting game of, well, nothing's broke yet, so you know, at what point does it break? And then someone will break something, and it's like then all of a sudden the floodgates open, and you know now it's a thousand horse, now it's twelve hundred, and then well, what happens at twelve hundred or thirteen, and then what happens at eighteen hundred or twenty one hundred, and it's it's kind of a process. And I know as enthusiasts we we all get kind of frustrated waiting for things, but it happens with every engine, every brand. It's just it takes those pioneers and companies like SoCal Diesel to take an engine, take it apart, look at it and say, you know, we've been doing this for a really long time. Here's the weak points. This is what's going to pop up. We're going to be proactive, get ahead of the curve a little bit. So when these things do happen, you can order these parts and, and put them into your, your engine build and then go out there and find the next one. And it's, it's kind of a long process. You know, we've definitely seen it in the Duramax world, the Cummins world, hitting the 2,000 horsepower mark, the 2,400 horsepower mark, different things are breaking there versus 1,200 or 1,000 or 800. Certainly. I mean, the laws of physics don't change. Um, you know, you, you, to make a certain amount of horsepower, you have to have a certain amount of cylinder pressure. I mean, that's the force that pushes the piston down. And, and remember, horsepower is just a calculation. It's the rate at which you apply torque. So, you know, the formula for horsepower, torque times RPM divided by 5252. Five, um, so to make torque, you have to have cylinder pressure. Cylinder pressure is the damaging force. And, of course, the lower the RPM you apply that, the more you stress out the part. So, you know, again, the laws of physics don't change. We can only apply a certain amount of heat and a certain amount of cylinder pressure to these engine components. And the only place I've ever, ever seen the laws of physics change is in an ad in a magazine or in the sales department. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> it, this this episode has been really fun and en enlightening to learn more about what goes into the actual parts in these engines, and whether it's a shop that calls you up or 
um, you know, a truck owner, the, the thing that, that I take away from it is there is no kind of general answer. You know, there is no, and we're used to stages, like, the, you know, it just there's these packages and these stages and things like that. But with these engines, it's not like that. Like, you guys need to know, you know, things about air and fuel and tuning and use and everything like that to be able to set set the build up correctly. What kind of questions should a shop or a truck owner want to, what information do they need to have when they call you guys? Like, what kind of questions are, are, are the the technicians on the phone going to ask where it can be a smoother process to get an engine build going? Honestly, I mean, the, it, it, the customer needs to be honest with themselves on where, where they want to take their truck, where their build is. So the thing that we always ask is, what kind of power level do you want to achieve? And what's the intended purpose of the truck? And if the guy says, I want to make, you know, 2,000 rear wheel horsepower, okay, fine, we can help you do that. I want to drive it every day. Okay, so let's stop right there. That's not going to happen. And I want to get 35 miles to the gallon. So, you know, we need to be realistic about what we're going to use this for. At some right. point, you know, it, it, it's, not, it's not a work vehicle anymore. It's a race vehicle. And so we have to kind of keep that in mind. And there's a lot of shops. There's a lot of people out there that, will, uh, that they'll build a fire-breathing monster for a guy. Um, and, and it'll be misapplied. You know, for some reason, the customer thinks that he can, you know, hook up to his fifth wheel and tow, you know, 20,000 pounds with huge injectors and huge turbos and huge fuel pumps, and it's just a recipe for failure. So, at SoCal Diesel, we try to develop a relationship with a customer. We want to we want to delve into exactly what he expects from his project, so that we can offer the best recommendation on parts or a complete package on the engine. And and that's obviously going to differ from from different customers, and so that's why we have many different parts to solve many different problems based on intended purpose and power level. I think, yeah, that's that's definitely something that uh, setting the expectation and the goal going into it, it can save a lot of money as well, you know, going into it knowing I'm going to drive this truck every day or I'm not, and being able to get the right parts the first time versus... I've got friends that have redone their builds a couple different times because they went into it not knowing exactly what they wanted, and it, it can get very expensive. So, I'm sure, I'm sure when uh, you know, shops or, or people call in, you guys have been doing this a long time, know exactly the questions to ask, how to guide people through that, and we all want to do that engine build just once. Or if we change it, it's because now it's just going to be a truck that's towed around to race events across the country, or it's going to the ultimate callout challenge, or diesel power challenge or something like that. We, we always use the analogy when we're speaking to the customer of, of baking a cake. We can put really good ingredients in the cake, and we can put any kind of frosting on it when we're done. And, and to tie that back into the engine, if he's not sure, you know what, I'm only going to make 1,000 now, but, man, UCC looks really good. You know, maybe someday I'm going to do this. Well, okay, let's build a really good bottom end. Let's go with a good crank, good set of rods, you know, good pistons, um, and if you decide that you want to go to that higher power level later, you've got all the ingredients in the cake there. You can put on a larger set of heads. You can go to larger injectors. You can go to bigger turbos. Everything is already there versus if you use lousy ingredients in the cake, no amount of good frosting is going to make that cake taste good. It's still going to be sour from the inside out. And so a lot of times that really rings true with a customer all of a sudden they kind of get it it's like oh i understand let's invest the money in the bottom end and let's get a really good strong bottom end first and then i can dress it up how i want later now i've got a really good platform i can build on i'm realizing too in, in chatting and just thinking about all these different topics we could make individual podcasts talking about camshafts, heads, <laughs> window ring, firing. There's so much that goes into an engine build, and that's what's so cool about them, is there's so many facets that are involved. And, and I think as being a, a diesel enthusiast or you're racing the vehicles, it can almost be overwhelming because there's so many different things. And we want to find a company that we trust that has done it for a really long time they they've seen everything where we can kind of lean on their experience and their expertise and the quality of the products and and those sorts of things so we save money and we're happy 
we're happy with the truck when it's done. You know, we're happy we spent the money. We're having fun with it. And that's really what separates SoCal Diesel, I think, um, from others in the industry is, is when you call here, we're not a parts warehouse. We're not someplace that's just going to sell you a part number one, two, three, four. When you call here, you're going to get an experienced technician on the phone that can walk you through the build. I won't put anybody on the phone that can't answer every technical question that a customer has when they call. And so we're offering information for free. A customer can call here and get a, just an excellent education on Duramax builds and what parts to use and so on and so forth. And then by offering that information and developing that relationship, we're hoping that he'll honor us with the purchase of either a racing engine or the parts for his build. But that's really what it comes down to is it just it breaks my heart when I get a call from somebody that said they bought parts from you know, a, a different company and maybe they, they ended up with the wrong part for their application. And just as you said earlier, here they are having to rebuild the engine again maybe because they got some uh, not-so-good advice. Um, and, and that's something that we we really take personally here. We really want to make sure we we offer the best advice to the customer for what their application is going to be. That's really one of the underlying things that I love about doing podcasts and chatting with companies and and people like yourself is we get these messages and emails or on Instagram or Facebook and they hear about the podcast and like, hey, I have a story. And, you know, sometimes they buy the truck and it has an issue or sometimes they didn't know. And it's such an emotional investment and an attachment to the vehicle. And when they didn't get good service or good advice, it, it becomes really intense. And some of the things that we read, it's just like, you know, we need to talk with Guy today from SoCal Diesel about setting up your engine. Or we need to talk about this part or that part. To, to get the awareness out there that there's places you can go, people you can talk to, where you don't have to go down this road of having spent twenty, thirty, forty, fifty thousand dollars the downtime. Um, you know, if it is a truck you drive every day, use it for work. It affects your work, and that's the other side of it that I think is so crucial and so awesome to be able to talk about this stuff. Is where can you find the great advice? Where can you be pointed in the right direction? build that relationship so you don't have to you know have this this horrible story about spending a lot of money and your vehicle doesn't work or run right or it left you stranded i think it you know i think it's the empathy i remember you know growing up as a kid and just you know saving and saving and saving so i could buy that latest and greatest part to put on my you know my car and then buying it and being disappointed with it like finding out that boy i just spent weeks and weeks and weeks or even months, you know, saving for this, thinking this is going to be the greatest thing in the world and put it on the car and be disappointed. So it's something that I guess if I was a better businessman, I would be looking at volume and only volume and sell everything to everybody. But, you know, the so-called culture is not that way. You know, the culture I developed this company is more along the lines of, you know, let's make sure the customer's happy with the product and, you know, that comes right from not only the engineering and design, but, you know, even the packaging of the product. You know, when he, when he opens up the box, is he going to be excited and all his friends are there and they're going to they're gonna open up this box and they're going to go, wow, you know, look at that. Um, mm-hmm. The detail we put into our complete racing engines, you know, uh, when the customer opens up the box, is he going to see that and everybody's going to go, man, that is fantastic. Or is he going to open up the box and go, oh, gosh, really, that's, that's what it is, huh? <laughs> so, and that's just something I drive home to all all the staff here at SoCal Diesel, it's like, look, this is what we're trying to achieve. And, uh, and I'm, v- I'm very happy with the way that uh, that has developed over the years. And that's definitely the, the, the perception and, and the reputation that SoCal Diesel has. And that's why I was really excited to be able to, to chat with you today is that's what the company's known for. It's what the products are known for. And the industry as a whole needs more of that. And there's, it could be any, it doesn't even have to be engines. It could be just some other small part, something else. And it can ruin the experience of being a diesel truck enthusiast. I've seen it. I've read it. I've talked to people um, that have had that happen. And we need more people to have a positive experience. 
we need more people to open that box and say, wow, this is great. And, uh, you know, I've got this engine in my truck and it performs really well or a set of heads or pistons, you know, I've, I've got this many passes on them and they're holding up well because then it gives them the confidence and then they talk to people, they talk to their friends, they talk to people at work and it, it allows us to grow and I think pushes the industry to a higher level and a higher standard, which we all want as you know, whether you work in it, you make parts, you design things or you drive the truck or you race it. And I think that's really the future and it's so cool to see you guys are not just doing this now, you've always done it. Very well said. I couldn't agree more. <laughs> well, we appreciate your time today, Guy, and I, I really want to sit down with you again and, and really hone in on different parts of the Duramax engine and things you guys are able to do. And there's so many questions we got, we couldn't touch on all of them today, but I'd love to be able to do that again in the future and and uh, deliver some more you know, value bombs, some Duramax value bombs out there for people who are looking to upgrade their engines or heads or you know, just put something together to, to meet their goals. I look forward to it. Yeah, I really feel like we just kind of scratched the surface. There's just uh, so much to talk about, right? It can just go on and on. Don't forget, diesel fans, make sure and head on over to dieselworldmag.com. Bookmark the page. Pick up an issue if you want to hear the latest and greatest in diesel event coverage, product reviews, and really cool one-off builds. And also go to nitro-gear.com looking to upgrade the gears on your Cummins Duramax or Powerstroke. They've got a complete lineup. Until next time, keep the shiny side up.